A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mass sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies. But he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he alright in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and a sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, 
though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There in the bottom of a small crater was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dulled perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002 and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? 
a kindly looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. He just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seem to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman, after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents and there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor, only it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Temby, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, 
The majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local school children singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, 
with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited, though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too, and as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant white birch tree and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck. There was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters, but eventually, the resistance became too much, D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembe in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembe Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site-5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. Ten, nine, eight. A mysterious, happy-sounding voice is counting down as a young man runs across a rotating beam. He is cut and bruised, leaving a trail of blood behind him as he struggles to reach the finish line. Seven, six, five. He hops onto the final platform. As a spinning saw blade comes buzzing out of the wall, he drops to the floor, moments before it takes off his head. Four, three, two. He stands up and sprints towards the end of this nightmare competition. The man leaps through the air, his arm outstretched towards the buzzer. One, zero, time's up. The announcer cries a split second before the man slaps the final buzzer. The lights go out, and the announcer's voice suddenly changes. It loses its clown-like quality and takes on a much more sinister tone. Looks like no winners this time. Now it's time for your punishment. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-024, also known as the Game Show of Death. SCP-024 is an abandoned soundstage which is a hangar-like structure that's normally used for the production of film and television projects. 
This specific soundstage has been abandoned for a number of years, though it's not known at this time if the anomalous properties it demonstrates had manifested before or after its abandonment. The anomalous location was first discovered by a group of teenagers who had illegally broken into the compound on which the soundstage is located. Only one of the teenagers who entered the soundstage returned, and the report she made to local police detailing her experience was more than enough to tip off the SCP Foundation that something was amiss. The Foundation immediately began mobilizing agents, and once the site was secured, a number of test groups were sent into SCP-024 to learn more about what was happening inside. From those groups, we now know that upon entering SCP-024, visitors are greeted by an announcer who is so far yet to be seen or otherwise identified. The announcer communicates with the visitors via an intercom system, and will listen and respond back to visitors as well. The announcer refers to those who enter SCP-024 as contestants and informs them that they will be participating in a game show with the opportunity to win fabulous prizes. The contestants are given fair warning, though, that the game will be extremely dangerous, and that only winners will be allowed to leave. At this point, the contestants are presented with the choice of whether to participate or not. Those who decline the offered terms are immediately expelled from SCP-024, and their re-entry is blocked by an invisible barrier. Those who choose to stay are then led further into the soundstage, to where they will participate in the actual game. The specific aesthetics and composition of the game changes with each new group of contestants, but the essence always remains the same – a long and elaborate obstacle course that must be navigated through. The precise rules also vary, with some games only allowing for a single winner, while others encourage the players to work together and form teams. The obstacles can range from relatively easy and safe challenges to life-threatening tests of skill. As the contestants make their way through the unusual obstacle course, the announcer will continually talk to them, giving them updates on other contestants, advice on how to progress, adjusting rules on the fly, or even conversing with the contestant directly. As the game goes on, the obstacles become more and more deadly and difficult to overcome. This has led to the not-so-rare occurrence of there being no winners with the entire pool of contestants having been killed or otherwise incapacitated by the various challenges. In these instances, the announcer will express his disappointment at there not being a winner, and SCP-024 appears to shut down, going dark until another group of contestants enter. Before beginning the game, the contestants are briefed on a number of rules, such as no assaulting the other contestants and no deliberate bypassing of obstacles. In the event that a rule is broken, the announcer will call out the offending contestant, and they are forcefully removed from the game by the studio guardians, who act as the physical enforcers of SCP-024's rules. The studio guardians can suddenly appear and disappear from anywhere inside SCP-024. Their exact look varies based on the theme of the obstacle course, but they always maintain a humanoid appearance, exhibit superhuman strength, and wear a mask or headgear that fully hides their face. Strangely. Winners of the game have later reported that while inside the game, the studio guardians appear only as gigantic, shadowy figures that would engulf offending contestants and then disappear. Should one or more persons complete the obstacle course and abide by the rules that were set out by the announcer, they are declared to be the winner and the recipient of a grand prize. Prizes have included cash, electronics, cars, collectibles, and even fully paid vacations to a variety of cities and countries. The type of prize awarded seems to be completely random, and examination of the prizes collected has shown them all to be genuine, with no unusual characteristics or anomalous properties. Those who did not complete the obstacle course are announced to be losers, and the lights within SCP-024 are then switched off. The winners will find themselves outside the soundstage with their prize, while the losers are never seen or heard from again. Attempts to track where the losers go or what happens to them have all failed. GPS locator beacons placed on test groups lost their signals as soon as the game ended, and it is unknown whether this is because they were destroyed or because they were taken somewhere that blocked the signals. Perhaps the strangest aspect of SCP-024 is what happens after the game show has ended. Outside of the soundstage is a mailbox, and following the completion of a game, whether a winner was crowned or not. A VHS tape or DVD containing a recording of the entire game will appear. 
This is despite Winters claiming to not see any cameras present while inside. Even more bizarre is the studio audience that can be seen on the recording watching the game and cheering on the contestants. Just like the cameras, winners have reported that there was no one present but the other contestants while they were inside SCP-024. The announcer also remains a mystery. During a test group which consisted solely of a Foundation researcher who conversed with the announcer, it became clear that it is both sentient and aware of events that take place in the outside world. As the researcher was the only contestant present, the announcer did not start the game and instead engaged in a conversation with the researcher. Most of the topics were centered around pop culture, and it's hypothesized that SCP-024's only means of learning about the outside world may be through television sources. Though attempts to test this theory by cutting lines and removing satellite dishes from the soundstage roof have not shown to have an impact on what the announcer knows. When it became clear that the Foundation researcher would be the only contestant at that time, the announcer politely asked them to leave and recommended that they return with additional contestants at a later date. SCP-024's nature means that it can't be moved to a secure location and it has been classified as Euclid. It has been determined that the best way to safely secure SCP-024 is to conceal its location. Five identical looking sound stages have been built around it and a security perimeter around the complex is maintained at all times. None of the security team members are told which is the real SCP-024 and to further prevent accidental entry, its entrance has been sealed by reinforced blast doors. Only D-Class personnel are now allowed to enter SCP-024 as test groups participating in the competition, and Foundation researchers may only observe remotely. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter SCP-024 without prior approval from a Level 4 researcher will lead to immediate apprehension, and termination of the offender has been authorized. In the event that containment is breached, or if the true nature of SCP-024 is compromised, the entire complex is to be immediately destroyed by the specialized demolition charges that are placed throughout the containment area. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy-looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years, though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building, but incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time, though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They've explored a lot of strange abandoned places, but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell, but just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. 
Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now. Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes, or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. But it's then that one of the explorers realizes he is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space. Gang signs, names, and street art for example. But it appears to fade in and out and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti. Much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting, such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear, leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening. But those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building. Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors, all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness, before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. 
their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition. No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping, and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. The bell rings but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming, and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist, recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams, and if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. Two men walk through a hot, dusty tunnel carved right into the rock. Their torches cast just enough light to see that the walls are covered with strange hieroglyphics. They've been in many tombs before, but they've never seen markings like these before. They spot something up ahead, a person slumped against the wall. One of the men rushes over and sees that whoever this was, they've been here a very long time. Nothing is left but bones and a few scraps of cloth. As the man examines the skeleton, his partner calls him over. There's something he has to see. He's looking through a hole in the tunnel wall, and on the other side is an enormous cavern. In the middle of the giant room is the strangest sight either man has ever seen. An enormous upside-down pyramid that stretches down from the roof of the cave. They look at each other in amazement before running down deeper into the tunnel, sure that it will lead them to the pyramid and the incredible treasures it must have inside. They can see through more holes in the tunnel wall that they are getting closer and closer to the pyramid. Finally, they reach an entrance into the uppermost and widest part of the structure. As they enter the upside-down pyramid, they see that the passages are at least twice as high as any they've ever seen, and are covered with more of the strange markings. They start walking through the passageway, and soon realize that there are numerous twists, turns, branching paths, and dead ends. It's a maze. The man turns to tell his friend that they should consider leaving and coming back with others, but he finds that he's all alone. They must have gotten separated at some point. He starts backtracking through the passages, turning this way and that, trying to retrace his steps. He abruptly stops, though, when he hears a strange noise. A metallic grinding sound fills the air. The man watches as the walls themselves start to move, shifting and rearranging themselves. Without warning, 
The open passage in front of him closes, sealing his path back. The man begins to scream. There's no answer to his cries. Panicked, he runs deeper and deeper into the maze, but try as he might, he can't find his friend. Or the exit. How long has he been walking? Hours? Days? He can remember hearing the walls shift at least one other time. Exhausted, he sits down against the wall. He'll just take a little rest. Then it's back to work. He must be able to find his way out. He must escape. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-875, also known as War Criminals. SCP-875 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a massive underground pyramid whose exact location is a closely guarded secret. As of yet, no record of the pyramid's construction has been found in any historical documents. Though there is evidence that suggests SCP-875 is a man-made structure. While the outside of SCP-875 is made of normal sandstone like the pyramids of Egypt, there is an inner layer composed of a metal alloy that has yet to be identified. The first floor of SCP-875 is accessible through a tunnel and contains a number of passageways that appear to have been built for entities much taller than humans. These passages are arranged into a maze-like configuration, complete with double backs and dead ends. Adding to the confusion is that the geography of the maze periodically changes. Mechanisms located within the walls and floor activate automatically every 48 hours, completely changing the layout. While anyone unlucky enough to be trapped within the shifting walls of SCP-875 may find themselves unable to leave by the path they entered, there are a number of hidden pressure plates and levers that can be found throughout the labyrinth that open up sections of the wall, creating new paths and shortcuts. But these switches also cause the release of what the Foundation has designated SCP-875-1. SCP-875-1 are small, flying insect-like creatures, approximately 6 centimeters long, with a mass of roughly 3 grams. They bear no resemblance to any known species of insect on Earth, suggesting that their origin may be extraterrestrial. When released, SCP-875-1s will swarm the nearest person, stinging them mercilessly. Their sting is highly acidic and causes severe damage to nerves and tendons, and this potent acid combined with their tendency to swarm, has resulted in victims' limbs becoming what can only be described as liquefied. Previous uses of explosives within the pyramid have left openings to a lower second floor that are relatively easy to access, provided that the maze's current configuration allows the breaches to be reached. The main feature of the second floor is four large vats, each of which contains a clear liquid similar in appearance to normal water that has been designated SCP-8752. When humans are exposed to SCP-8752, they experience effects similar to an amnestic, but with the added sensation of feeling both happy and satisfied. Following what look like maintenance tunnels on the second floor leads down to a third floor of the pyramid that is home to a large nuclear reactor. The reactor takes up most of the area of this level of the pyramid and appears to be self-cooling with no evidence of a meltdown or other nuclear disaster having taken place. This reactor seems to be powering the rest of the pyramid, including the maze reorganizing mechanisms on the first floor, as well as what's hidden on the mysterious lowest level of SCP-875. Although there is no direct access to the fourth floor of the pyramid, tunneling through the floor of the third level has revealed something incredible. Inside a small room are what look to be ten separate cryogenic stasis chambers. The chambers are arranged in a circular formation, and strangest of all, they're all occupied. Inside each pod is a large, insectoid creature roughly 3 meters tall and weighing 240 kilograms that have been designated SCP-8753. Three of the creatures appear to have died from their stasis chambers failing at some point in the past, and heavy decomposition has set in. Several other of the insectoid creatures are heavily damaged, though it is unknown if this is due to issues with the pods or if they had sustained injuries prior to entering stasis. While it is not known what exactly these creatures are, where they came from, or if their origin is even terrestrial, examination and analysis of some of the images carved into the walls of SCP-875's first floor have provided interesting information. In one, two figures that bear a resemblance to SCP-8753 are depicted facing each other, with one appearing to be stabbing the other with a spear, implying some kind of violent conflict in the past. In the next, 
Another figure that looks like SCP-8753 is shown presenting a stone slab to what looks to be a human dressed in the garb of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian is facing away from the insectoid, which might suggest a breakdown in communication or an unwillingness of the Egyptian to listen to the insectoid. The third image, though, shows two humanoid figures now bowing to the insectoid figure, next to an image of a chalice with a drop of liquid falling into it. This may represent SCP-8752, the amnestic liquid, and the way its effects were used to subdue this group of people. This hypothesis is further strengthened by a fourth image that shows an insectoid figure watching two humanoids pulling what looks like a large stone block with ropes. A fifth image shows the insectoid figure standing next to what looks like a dead humanoid, consuming a part of it. And finally, a sixth image depicts the insectoid inside of a small rectangle that may represent the stasis chambers found on the lowest level of the pyramid. Are these entities sleeping inside the stasis chambers the same ones depicted on the walls of the pyramid? Did they arrive on Earth and subjugate a group of humans, forcing them to build a monument that could contain their stasis chambers and keep them in a form of perennial living death? Perhaps this question has been answered by a mysterious transmission that was detected by the Foundation. Coming from an unknown source, the transmission was in English, but the grammar and word choice sounded like it was from someone who had only the most basic understanding of the language. The transmission, in no uncertain terms, demanded the return of the war criminals, and that if they were not returned, that 95% of the species would be made extinct. It then went on to describe a number of offenses perpetrated by these war criminals, including claims of massacres and cannibalism. Were the creatures in the bottom of SCP-875 convicts on the run, war criminals from another planet or even another reality, who had fled to Earth to escape justice? It may never be known for sure, as the message degraded and became unintelligible before it could finish. Due to its stable location and the relative ease with which the public can be kept away from it, SCP-875 has been classified as safe. Its location is marked as a military base on maps, with satellite images altered according to Procedure Watson 24. Civilians who approach the area are to be taken into Foundation custody and administered Class A amnestics. Research personnel are only allowed inside SCP-875 when accompanied by two security staff, and six maintenance personnel are to monitor the nuclear reactor at all times. If any staff are stung by instances of SCP-8751, they are to be treated on-site by medical personnel with alkali to neutralize the acidic stings. And in extreme cases, amputation of the affected limbs is authorized. In the event that an SCP-8753 specimen becomes active, security personnel are to subdue them in a non-fatal manner if possible and transport them to a secure site for further research. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob. And make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.